How many people want to? Okay. Okay, got it. Halfway. Okay. Okay, so we are. Okay, okay so now we are live and recording. So, Ruben, okay. if you if you may assume, thank you. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, thanks for the committee, and uh, we are here for the qualification defense of the project actually the qualification here is the defense of the project uh, phd project of uh, danilo fries and danilo you have uh, uh, 30 35 to 40 minutes around that to present your your project then we'll go through the uh, discussion with the committee okay go ahead please Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, and uh, can you see my screen? Is it working? Yeah, but it's not in presentation mode. Is it now? Okay, now it is. Okay, so I'd first like to thank the presence of Professor Huben Sommer and Professor Dell Atkinson, uh, and I'm going to talk about my doctoral qualifying, uh, the things I've done so far. So I entitled this the, on the elastic excitation of spin waves and the magnetoelastic interaction. And I'd like to thank my supervisors also, João Paulo Mercedes and also Luis Sampaio, which has been a part of this supervision from the beginning. Okay, so speaking of my doctoral uh, projects and the things I've been done, I have done so far, uh, so here on the right, you see my microscopy of my interdigital transducers. I put some pictures that you show some of the work I've done. So this is the organization of this presentation, intro, theoretical background, materials, results, and conclusions. Okay, so speaking of the introduction, uh, so my work is inside the, this area of spintronics. So this idea of doing electronics, using the next generation of electronics using spin current, the spin degree of freedom instead of just the electric current, just the charge current. And low power, cons uh, the idea of you having a computational power uh, with low power cons consuming. And, and inside spintronics, you already know very much about spintronics, but inside spintronics, there are specific phenomena, which are the spin waves here on the right. And the spin waves are, are these wave-like phenomena in magnetic materials. And these are very low energy uh, excitations. And these, uh, these type of excitations can probe the the capacity of have um, wave-like computing is spintronics and wave, wave phenomena. Uh, so the area of using these spin waves inside spintronics is known as magnon spintronics or magnonics. So the idea of magnonics is using spin waves in the quanta magnons as information carriers. And here, just to give some examples, uh, here I show a, a magnon transistor. On the left, on the right, I show a magnet logic gate. And in the middle, the, the book of Professor Sergio Rezende, which has been a collaborator in some parts of this work, uh, The Fundamentals of Magnonics. And I highly recommend the reading of this book. Okay. So inside magnonics, uh, there are some challenges. Uh, like we need to excite, we need to detect the spin waves, and we need to process the spin waves. Uh, one challenge is to excite spin waves because uh, they are usually excited uh, using inductive uh, methods. And these inductive methods are highly power consuming. So this jeopardizes the overall power uh, of the whole system. And there are some other challenges. In order to overcome those challenges, one idea has shown up in literature that is that to couple uh, these spin waves to elastic waves. And that's what I'm showing here. So elastic waves uh, in, in solids, uh, there is a, a technological way of exciting elastic waves that is being very well established in literature is by using these interdigital transducers here uh, on top of piezoelectric materials. So uh, by applying a radio frequency tension in these insulating materials, so this is only voltage driven, it's very energy efficient. It's been used in 
in, tech, in industry for a long time now. Uh, we can use these interdigital transducers in a piezoelectric substrate to create surface acoustic waves. So elastic waves, uh, Rayleigh waves, love waves. And these are very energy efficient. So the idea that has shown up in literature is not new. It's been for some time. It's to couple these elastic waves to uh, drive magnetization dynamics in magnetoelastic materials. So magnetoelastic effect. So you change the dimensions. You apply strain. You apply strain the magnetic material. The magnetic momentum is deviated from the 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 equilibrium. So by using materials that have this, uh, that have a significant magnetoelastic effect, we can excite spin waves uh, from elastic waves. So we have a only voltage driven effect. We don't have uh, ohmic losses here. So it's very energy efficient. So my work started uh, in this idea of uh, studying the, the, the hybridiz hybridization between magnetic states and elastic states. And so just to give some examples of uh, uh, papers in this area. So this one from 2012 was on the, one of the first uh, one articles from this last generation to, to show that there are some characteristics of this acoustic excitation of ferromagnetic resonance. So here two interdigital transducers with a nickel film, which is magnet restrictive. One of them is that the, uh, the elastic uh, dispersion, which is this straight one, and the magnetic, which is this almost uh, without a slope here, uh, they, they, they suffer a crossover due to the magnetoelastic interaction. So we have a magnetic curve that becomes a, 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 an elastic one and the other branch is the opposite. This is one of the characteristics of these excitations, these hybridizations. And here on the right, another characteristic is that uh, the coupling between the, the spin waves and the elastic waves is uh, optimized when the angle between the K, the wave direction, and the magnetization is not perpendicular or parallel. Uh, it's maximized when it has an angle. So, 45 degrees, for instance, uh, for some uh, setups is the maximum. So we have this angle variation and we have this splitting of the curves due to the hybridization. Uh, another example from 2020, uh, ac acoustic spin pumping. So using the same setup, um, here is the spectral or uh, the spectral analysis of the interdigital transducer. So we have a peak here. So these interdigital transducers, they are long used in industry, where in the kilo and megahertz range. So using them in the gigahertz range is, is very challenging. Ooh. And it's, it's been showing up uh, not so long ago. So here, here is some, we need some technology to do that. Uh, here again, the characteristic of having a maximum at 45 degrees. And here it's showing the, the spin pumping effect by, uh, by using, making use of acoustic waves and the power here. Uh, and finally, this uh, work from 2018 and from Holanda and Sergio Resendez group, uh, not only we can couple these magnon and phonon states, we can al also make conversion between magnon and phonon states. And here's what they've shown. This was the first base we had where we were collaborating with this group. Uh, so using the two branch separations, the anti-crossing between the two branches here, uh, by making use of of a, a non-uniform uh, magnetic field, so a spatially varying magnetic field. So the dispersion curve changes with the position. And by exciting a magnon only state, by changing the magnetic field, here we do not have, we have energy conservation, but not momentum conservation. This magnon uh, uh, gradually becomes a phonon. And uh, this, this here shows that in brillouin light scattering, you can see that both the phonon and the magnon have a circular polarization. So it indicates that this phonon created this way carries the angular momentum of the magnon. So uh, this was the main work, our main reference for my, for my PhD thesis. And so my, ob my objectives were to simulate numerically, it's something our group do for a long time, but also to do that experimentally 
uh, to measure these uh, magnetoelastic eigenmodes and also the magnophono interconversion by using this spatially varying magnetic field. So our idea is to generate these interdigital transducers and by applying a spatially varying magnetic field, we could do this uh, interconversion between magnons and phonons and phonons to magnons. So this was our goal. So uh, spoiler alert, the, the experimental part, we couldn't go to, to the end. Uh, mainly because there was a COVID pandemic in the middle of everything. So it became a lot challenging, uh, but I'm going to show what I have so far and how in the last year I focused on micromagnetic simulations. So I'm going to also show the micromagnetic simulations I've performed. Okay, so just quickly talking about the theoretical background, I'm sure you're very familiar with the magnetization dynamics. So we describe the magnetization evolution with the landau lipschitz gilbert equation, uh, which we have a precession and a damping terms. The precession is about uh, the effective uh, position. So the effective magnetic field, which is obtained from the total energy. And this total energy includes lots of terms, uh, the magnetic, energy, so the exchange interaction, the Zeeman energy, the magnetostatic interaction, the uniaxial, uh, the anisotropies, and also the magnetoelastic interaction. Here, uh, there's this coupling between the effective magnetic field and these epsilons, which are the strings. So there's a coupling between them. So the longitudinal and the transverse components of the string. Okay. Uh, when we talk about spin waves, we're actually looking for plane wave solutions uh, for the Landau-Lifshitz-Gilbert equation in the Landau-Lifshitz-Gilbert equation. So uh, by doing Fourier transforms, so in a bulk material, so an infinite material in three dimensions, this is what we get: the herring kittel equation, uh, the dispersion relation for a low k. This is what we get: the typical Kittel equation we we've seen many times. And for a thin film, we have to include the, the effective dipolar of uh, magnetostatic energy in the equation. And Kalinikos and Slavin in 86 got this uh, solution for this plane wave, uh, for this plane wave, for the thin film, uh, the dispersion relation, the thin film. Uh, the important thing here to highlight is that the dispersion relation is very anisotropic. So if the magnetization is perpendicular to the wave direction, we have surface waves, which are forward, they have a positive group velocity. On the other hand, if they are parallel to each other, we have volume modes, which are backwards. They have uh, negative group velocities in some wave number range. So they, they are very anisotropic. Uh, on the other hand, talking about the elastic waves. So here are definition of strain and stress. They are connected by Hooke's law for a linear material. So we can get uh, an equation of motion. So this equation will be equivalent to the landau lipschitz gilbert equation for the magnetic uh, material. So for a cubic crystal, by looking for plane wave uh, solutions in these equations, we actually obtain a linear relation between frequency and wave number. And the transverse and longitudinal components are, can be calculated like this, this slope, the velocity, group velocity. In magnet, when we're talking about a magnetoelastic interaction, we have an effective magnetoelastic energy. And from this, we can calculate the effective magnetic field due to this. So a magnetic field that depends on strain. Uh, and also we can calculate an effective force, which will go to in the equation of motion for the elastic waves. And this depends on the magnetization. So we have a magnetoelastic feedback there. If you look for harmonic solutions for both displacement and magnetization, these are the equations we obtain. Uh, and in which you can see the, the, the separation in two branches, so magnon to phonon, phonon to magnon, with an anti-crossing between them. And the anti-crossing distance here is proportional to the, the intensity of the coupling between them. Okay? Uh, so just an overview of the theory. So speaking about the materials and methods, so in order to do the experiment, the experiments we wanted, we need to choose a piezoelectric material and we needed to choose uh, a magnet, magnetostrictive, magnetoelastic material. We've chosen the piezoelectric material to be zinc oxide. Uh, 
Uh, zinc oxide is a typical material used in surface acoustic wave devices in literature. So that's why we chose it. Uh, it, can, it can have uh, several crystalline forms. Uh, the, 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 the direction uh, with uh, most piezoelectric coefficient most effective is the 002, so here. So we just showing some examples always seen in literature. So we, by varying the film thickness, we needed a film, to, in order to have this uh, orientation, we need a, view, a, a high thickness in the order of one micrometer uh, to, to, to have an effective piezoelectric effect. And here we need a uh, high thickness, we need oxygen, uh, the cross a section of our material has to have these grains with highly oriented uh, grains. So this is what we're aiming for. Uh, for magnetic film, we've chosen EEC, which is the Etron Iron Garnet. Uh, it's a ferromagnetic insulator with a very small magnetic damping. It's been used in since the 60s uh, for studying spin waves. It's a typical material for studying spin waves. It's the, the same material the Hollanda article used uh, to do the magnophone interconversion. And we have two different films uh, we used in this. Uh, I believe in the text I, I said that, but if it was not that clear, I'm going to clear Clear, clarify that now. So we have a material, uh, egg samples uh, made by liquid phase epoxy. They are seven micrometers, seven micrometers thick, one, one, one oriented. They were fabricated by Sergio's group. Uh, we, we do not fabricate them. So we just have like very few samples of those and actually just two samples of those. So we could not get it wrong. So in order to do some testings, in order to do some experiments with more time, we actually use our uh, self-fabricated from uh, magnet magnetron sputtering. They were in the order of 500 nanometers thick. So the damping is very different. Here from LPE, they are in the order of 10 to the minus four. And from magnetron sputtering, they're order of 10 to the minus three, the alpha, the Gilbert damping. So very different uh, magnetic properties. Okay, so we use these two. Uh, I'm going to say in the results when I'm used one or the other. But the, the main one was the LPE one, but we did some, did some testing with the magnetic sputtering. And here I'd like to thank uh, Rodrigo Torrão uh, for helping me with the, the, the sputtering of, of the EEG samples. Okay, so the sample fabrication, you implied uh, electron beam lithography. This I'm showing here on the right because it was very challenging to do that because our substrate was very insulating. So both the zinc oxide, both the IG and both the GGG, they were very insulating. It's very hard to do uh, electron beam lithography and insulating substrate because there's lots of charging effect. We just could solve, we could only do the lithography by depositing a three nanometers gold layer on top of the resistor prior to exposition. So this was a technique we had to develop. Uh, it took some months of my, my PhD time uh, to find out how to do that. Okay, and uh, we also used other equipments like X-ray diffraction, electron microscopy, they are all described in the, in the text. But I just want to highlight here the brittle one light scattering, which is not in CBPF, it's in Sergio Rezende's group in Recife, in, in the Federal University of Pernambuco, we had to go there to use the brittle one light scattering. The idea of having an inelastic scattering of light, uh, we can have these two processes, the Stokes and anti-Stokes, so increasing fre uh, frequency, shift, a positive shifting frequency and a negative shifting frequency. Uh, the brilliant light scattering experiment is done. Uh, we put a mirror behind the egg sample, which is uh, which is transparent, has a transparency. Uh, the reflected wave, due to the reflection of the wave, we actually can have a variation of the uh, having plane momentum conservation. So the exc the excitation uh, of the laser will have a, a specific k, which is proportional to the sine of alpha, the incidence angle. So we can have uh, we can resolve uh, our excitation by k. So have a K resolved Berlin light scattering. So this is the main idea of this. And the micromagnetic simulations, we implied MUMEX-3 software, 
which solves the, the lambda all leaf sheets torque and the energy minimization. And the different thing here is that we employed the magnetoelastic module of MuMax, which is very novel. It's, it's, it's on the air since uh, the, the end of last year, the end of 2020, uh, which includes the elastic and kinetic and magnetoelastic energies. And it solves the coupled equations. So the landau lifshitz gilbert equation, but also coupled to it, the, the elastic equation of motion. So all of these are solved coupled in this module. Okay, so speaking of the results now, uh, so the experimental results, here is a picture of the Brillouin light scattering equipment. Here is our angle measurement, very technological angle measurement system is this thing here. So we started by doing the ZNO, the positioning radio frequency uh, magnetic sputtering. So here I'm just showing the, uh, the spectrum of the, the X-ray diffractions. So uh, here without oxygen is the, the black one. Uh, we didn't have the, the 002 direction uh, orientation, but when we employed uh, the, the, the oxygen, we start uh, having this. So we're just uh, trying to improve the quality of the ZNO, the zinc oxide we're depositing. Here we are depositing on silicon substrate, a CO2 substrate. So we added thermal treatment and we have varied the oxygen proportions. Here is summarized for a 400 uh, degrees Celsius. This is why we have the full width, width uh, half maximum. This is why we, we had. Uh, we also did the cross section of the, the samples. You uh, see, uh, in some, without oxygen, we do not have their grain orientation, but we start having when we, we put some oxygen there. And so for our final film, we're doing the optimization. So we even, uh, we, Actually, we actually turned the power from 100 to, uh, to 50 watts, so lower uh, power, so we could have more crystalline results. And we also test this on, in, on EEG GGG uh, substrate, so we had uh, uh, good results compared to the literature using these uh, properties here. And we, we made a final uh, ZNO film of one micrometer thick. So I'm going fast here because I don't have much time, but you can. Uh, I believe you will have some questions on this. Uh, so the, the interdigital transducer lithography, I had to do that process uh, by to reduce charging effect. It was very hard to do. And our final uh, interdigital transducers were like this. They were 550 nanometers uh, wide uh, with, a, with a periodicity of uh, four uh, micrometers. Okay, this was the final IDT we are retained. So after obtaining the final IDT, the interdigital transducer, we did this sample. This, this is how we built it. We got a EGGG sample and we deposited the zinc oxide with those proportions in these two separate islands. And on top of these two separate islands, we did the lithography to the IDT transducers. And then we did the electro, electrical contacts with silver glue. It was not the best probably, but here is the an example of sample we obtained. And then we did some electrotransmission uh, measurements, which is uh, in the input IDT, we connected to a radio frequency generator. The output, we connect to a rectifying diode and a voltmeter and measured the output signal by doing an, an excitation in the input one. And for our, for our bulk X, so the uh, liquid phase epitaxy, the low damping one, this is what we got. So this series of peaks here, we were very excited. We were like, okay, we're doing acoustic excitation and the X sputtering, we only have these two peaks, which was a bit uh, warning. We, we are very cautious. Oh, maybe we're not doing acoustic excitation because we do have these very different uh, results. Uh, even the ZNO being the same, we're having very different results. So we were very worried. So the, the liquid phase epitaxis example was sent to Recife to do the Brillouin really light scattering experiment. And the sputtering stayed with, her, with those here in CBPF. So we did some, uh, repeated this experiment of measuring exciting with the radio frequency and measuring the output signal uh, by changing inside a magnetic field. 
So here's the spectrum. And here is by varying the magnetic field, these things uh, happen. So we have these dips in the, in the, uh, in the output signal. So these absorptions in the, 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 uh, at some magnetic fields. And so I plotted this uh, magnetic field as a function of the frequency. So a frequency versus magnetic field dispersion. And we actually got these results these red results, and we didn't know exactly what to do with that, what that meant. Uh, for some reason, uh, more than one year later than doing the experiment, I decided to fit, we're fitting like spin wave equations with k different than zero. But more than one year later, I said, let me try k equals zero. Uh, so the ferromagnetic resonance mode, and it is there, this dashed curve. So we just fit it uh, very nicely to the, to the data. And this was a warning for us. This was maybe our interdigital transducers are not generating acoustic waves, or maybe the acoustic waves are there, but they are very damped. Or the electro electromagnetic effect of the interdigital, the inductive, the inductance in the, in the, in the, in the IDTs were making an electrical excitation, which was much more intense than the acoustic signal. So they were overshadowed by these signals. So this was the first uh, indication of this. Uh, the LPE, the low damping example, we enter blue one light scattering. So again, we fixed the, uh, the alpha, so the incidence angle. Uh, so I fixed the excitation K, the wavelength, and we did the spectrum by varying frequency and magnetic field. So so for each field, we did, we did a, an experiment. See, uh, we have these around 8 gigahertz. We have these peaks that do not change with the frequency. They, they are uh, thermal magnets that are being excited. But we do have another peak here, the Stokes and anti-Stokes, that correspond to the same, uh, the same frequency as the excitation, the radio frequency excitation. So we measure these peaks. Uh, the, the, the counts of each peak and put uh, in on these graphs for, for each frequency, each point here is a one spectrum that we obtain. And as you can see, we have a maximum in each of them. So I got this maximum frequency, uh, maximum magnetic field as a function of frequency put on the graph. And we do not know why the alpha equals 22, which is equivalent to K equals 19.5. Uh, radians to micrometers uh, was not matching. We are expecting to excite these spin waves. But when I try again, when I try the K equals zero, this is what we get. K equals zero. So again, our interdigital transducers were exciting the ferromagnetic resonance and not the spin wave uh, with K different than zero modes as we would expect. So after that, uh, we, we, we wanted to do some uh, new trials with these experiments, but it was right when the COVID pandemic started. So our uh, experimental work was very jeopardized by this. So we had to focus on the electro, on, on our micromagnetic simulations because, because we're staying at home. And I'm gonna show now my micromagnetic uh, simulation results. But that's where I stopped. Uh, we did some testings. We can talk about this in the end, uh, experimental tests. But this is pretty much what we've achieved so far. Uh, speaking of micromagnetic simulations, here on the right, I'm showing an example of what I do during my PhD time, uh, more than one year now just doing codes. Uh, so there are two things we're showing here. The first one is acoustic wave surfing. So how the strain excitation can drive spin waves. This was the first thing we've studied and we published this article. In, uh, but the second one, this magnetoelastic interconversion, um, uh, it's not finished yet. So I'm gonna show you the preliminary results. So for the acoustic wave surfing, so here we published it in the beginning of this year in Journal of Physics D. Basically what we did, we got a nickel stripe that, that is uh, one micrometer uh, wide and very long, so 10 micrometers uh, long. Uh, we did a strain excitation 
So we disregard the unioxal anisotropy for simplicity. We put the, uh, the magnetoelastic coupling coefficients and we did a strain excitation like this. So with a specific K and specific omega with a acoustic velocity of 4,000 uh, meters per second, which is a typical uh, piezoelectric material uh, sound velocity. And the first thing we've done is to, was to check if the simulations were working by changing the direction of the magnetization and doing this excitation and measuring the amplitude of the spin wave that's formed there. So here's a polar pro plot of it when we have uh, the magnetization parallel or perpendicular to the K. Uh, we, we get a very low amplitude. When we are 45 degrees, we have a maximum degree. Uh, maximum, uh, a maximum amplitude spin wave formed there. And this, this can be explained by the, the magnetoelastic uh, effective field. Okay, uh, so I'm going to show it briefly. Uh, so we're between the spin wave modes for two extreme cases where the acoustic wave, the last, the strain wave is strongly attenuated. So it just happens here at the beginning of the stripe and then it rapidly, rapidly dies. And the non-attenuated case in which the strain excitation goes, goes all the way to the end of the stripe. So this non-attenuated case would typically be the one uh, we would be saying experimentally because these acoustic waves propagate in the order of millimeters, they, they have much, they, 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 their dumping is very much lower than the, the magnetic ones. So they propagate much more than spin waves. So we have very different behaviors. In both cases, the spin wave, the magnetic wave that's formed there uh, presents the same frequency as the excitation, but not the same wavelength. Uh, on the strongly attenuated, we, the, the spin waves uh, wave, wave number just change the natural dispersion curves of the spin waves in that samples, just like we were exciting with an antenna LED or a coplanar waveguide. So we have these many modes here in the dispersion relations because of the lateral confinement of these, these stripe. Uh, we have these Tilt, very tilted because the magnetization was fixed at 45 degrees for maximum coupling. I didn't say that, but it's important to highlight. We fixed the magnetization direction in 45 uh, degrees. So we have this tilted wave front and this dispersion. In the non-attenuated, uh, we still have these minor uh, natural dispersions, but the main one is the, uh, this dashed line represents the acoustic uh, dispersion relation, which is linear. So the dispersion relation of the magnetization follows the acoustic one. So this is what we call uh, the, uh, the, the acoustic wave surfing. So the magnetic wave surface surfs on the acoustic wave, the elastic wave. So it forces the, the magnetic wave to propagate in, the, in the, not necessarily its uh, disper natural dispersion. So it's a, a magnetoelastic wave here. Uh, we also calculate how we could measure these phenomena uh, with the spin pumping and inverse spin hole effect by uh, depositing a stripe of a uh, of a platinum, so a non-magnetic material, in order to have spin pumping, but with a high uh, spin orbit coupling in order to have uh, inverse spin hole effect. So we put this stripe here uh, and we measure the spin current that is being pumped to the non-magnetic material and also the, the charge current that is being formed in this non-magnetic material that, due to the inverse spin hole effect. So the spin uh, current, as you can see, this is the evolution of magnetization um, in our film. And from these, we calculated the spin current with this equation uh, by considering uh, sine and cosine. Uh, here is important to highlight the direction. So we consider the U direction to be parallel to the magnetization and V direction perpendicular. So we did this in this rotated uh, axis. So, in the U direction, so parallel to the magnetization, the spin current is uniform, whereas the, in the V direction, the spin current is alternate and the opposite happens to the charge current. In the U direction, here is these arrows, it's uh, uh, alternate and in the V direction, it's constant. So perpendicular to the magnetization have a constant current, uh, uh, charge current. 
So this can be summarized here by the potential difference, uh, the delta V I uh, in which you have this in the U direction, the magnetization direction, alternate uh, I she voltage, and in the V direction, uh, constant I she voltage. And the, the amplitude of the AC component is 13 times bigger than the DC one. So here are the corresponding equations. Uh, also, if you change the magnetic field, these are, this is a resonant phenomena. When the acoustic wave and the magnetic wave uh, natural dispersion cross each other and they match, we have this maximum in, in, in IC voltage. So this can be a measurement of the crossing of the two curves when where they cross. And here we are in the frequency range where the anti-crossing we would, we would expect is in much higher, we are not in the frequency range of that anti-crossing of curves due to the magnetoelastic effect. It's important to highlight this. And here how the IC voltage varies with uh, the power. Um, the AC has this square root behavior and the DC has this linear behavior, okay? Uh, so this is uh, what we publish. It, it's more described, we compare these in the, in the text, it's more compared to the literature. I think it's more clear, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask. And finally, this is the last part. Uh, the, uh, I wanted to do to, to try that uh, experiment of magnet phono interconversion, uh, magnetoelastic interconversion, because there are no quantum phenomena in these simulations, uh, by using the magnetoelastic mu max module. So what I did, I got a cobalt iron boron uh, parameters, so magnetic and elastic ones. And I did a stripe here. These are just preliminary results. This is not published. This is not finished yet. Uh, I did a, a sync excitation here in the middle, a magnetic excitation. And then I measure how the magnetization and the displacement evolves in time. So by doing a two-dimensional fast Fourier transform, we can obtain this frequency and uh, dispersion relation, frequency and wave number dispersion relations. Uh, what's important to highlight here is in the magnetic uh, mode, we can see this is the magnetic curve and we have the linear elastic curve with the anti-crossing here. See, it's in the 25 gigahertz frequency region. And, and we have two elastic modes, one of in the x-direction, which is the longitudinal one, which have a high slope. And, and in the transverse directions, y and z, uh, we have these uh, northern slopes, so they are the transverse velocity, which is smaller compared to, to the, the longitudinal one. And only the transverse uh, components are uh, hybridized with the magnetic one. We did not have this hybridization with the longitudinal one. This is one thing. Uh, by varying the magnetic field intensity, the external field intensity, oh, I didn't highlight it enough. But the, the magnetic field, the external field is applied in the y direction. And here I'm using periodic boundary conditions. So these curves are obtained for infinite film. So this is a, the modes for an infinite film. So here we, we do not have the, those uh, uh, se several modes because we're considering an infinite film. And by changing the magnetic field intensity, the magnetic curve changes its position, as you can see here, 40 uh, millitesla, and here 200 millitesla, it changes uh, the magnetic curve, but the elastic curve doesn't change. But this causes the crossover region to change its position due to the magnetic curve. And as you can see here, it varies. What I did, I turned off the coupling and measured the magnetic uh, wave number peak as a function of the external field and the elastic one without coupling. So the elastic doesn't change its position, wave number position, because it, uh, it doesn't care about the magnetic field, but the magnetic one varies. Uh, the wave number becomes smaller as the magnetic field gets in more intense. And when we turn on the coupling again, we see our anti-crossing here again. So our idea is to use uh, a spatially varying magnetic field in order to make uh, the curve, the excitation varies from a, magnet, a pure magnetic excitation and becomes a pure elastic excitation, just like the experiment of Hollanda. 
So to do that, we did this uh, external field varying quadratically. So the starting position is here. In the edges, we added absorbing boundaries. So the, the, when we get in this region or in this region, the, the pulse is absorbed, both the elastic and the magnetic. So we did the pulse here. Uh, two wave fronts are formed. Uh, this, the, the, left, the left going one is readily absorbed. The right going one propagates, uh, varies the magnetic field. Uh, as you can see here, uh, other pulses appear, other peaks appear, and then it's until it's absorbed on the right hand side. So as you can see here, we have the wave number variation of the magnetization is is very continuous. The the elastic one has a has a jump, sudden jump here. The sudden jump here corresponds to the point in which you get to the the elastic. So here is the pure magnetic. We have a very small intensity here on the on the Fourier transform amplitude. You can see as we are exciting, both of them peak. Uh, but the, the elastic one becomes has a very small amplitude. Uh, here it's normalized, but it's very small amplitude. But when you get here to this point where you have this jump of wave number, the elastic amplitude just goes up. Uh, it's not what we would expect if you didn't, didn't have this interconversion. So this is an indication that there was a conversion to elastic modes. And finally, I repeated the same experiment, but without any dumping, not magnetic, nor uh, elastic. And here's what we get. So we have the magneto, uh, magnetic, the total energy here has a peak when I'm exciting. And then the left going one is absorbed. And then the total energy remains constant, but there's a change here between magnetic and elastic energy. This is also, uh, showing that there is a conversion between magnetic and elastic modes due to the spatially varying magnetic field. Okay, so just to conclude, uh, I'm not going to read it all, you can be calm. <laughs> uh, basically, the experimental part, we did the, the ZNL from the position by magnetic sputtering, we could do the electron beam lithography, but the transducers do not generate the acoustic waves we were expecting. Uh, maybe they, they generated, but it was very much attenuated. We couldn't do experiments with the acoustic waves yet. Uh, but we, they did get excite the ferromagnetic resonance modes. So the K equals zero modes, which were, we, we were not expecting. Maybe there is some current leakage there. Uh, maybe, maybe we have a, a long range excitation and we need to understand that why. So we need to improve our piezoelectric film, uh, our electric contacts and the measurement setup for the for this detection of the waves. And we also intended to use a uh, lithium niobate substrate because all of the works are using this. Maybe there is some technical reason for that and yeah, we want to try that. And from micromagne micromagnetic simulation side, we did calculate the the elastic excited, uh, elastic driven magnetization dynamics, the spin pumping and IC voltage. And uh, we published these results. And now we need to publish the results for this uh, magneto elastic interconversion uh, modes. Okay, so just to finalize, I'd like to thank uh, well, Jean, my supervisor, João Paulo, Mercedes, Luis São Paulo, Luis Sampaio, and also Professor Sergio Rezende and his student, Daniel. Uh, which helped me very much with the Brill One Light Scattering and was a part of this cooperation, and also CBPF, Labnano, and the funding agencies. And thank you very much for your time. And that's it. Thank you, Danilo, for the explanation. Thank now you. we're going to move to the next step that will be the uh, discussion with the committee. Please, Dale, I would like you to make your first comments and observations for the for Danilo yeah you are muted can you hear me now yeah yeah okay um thank you Danilo that was very uh, very interesting a very well organized presentation um I thought you gave very good context to the work uh, of others and also explained very clearly what your collaborations were I think it's clear what you're trying to achieve and I think it's also very clear um, that you're very enthusiastic about this topic, which is always nice to see in a, in a young researcher. So uh, 
congratulations on the presentation and uh, thank you for the report. I enjoyed thank reading. Uh, I enjoyed reading the report and uh, I have some questions, as you might imagine. Um, but you, with your growing knowledge and your growing expertise in uh, in, in magnonics, my first question will be quite a simple one. Of, of, uh, as, as I see it, there's some really interesting fundamental physics measurements that people can do with these kind of magnonic structures and looking at, you know, uh, uh, magnon wave waveguides, etc. But in your view, uh, what do you think the big challenges are for making magnonics competitive with other kinds of spintronics and with silicon technology? So ultimately, I'm asking you a very hard question about the real life potential for magnonics. Oh, okay. Uh... It's very hard because uh, we need to know a little bit more about how industry works and uh, how is industry looking forward for the next generation of electronics or spintronics or magnonics. But I believe the big challenge we have here is the excitation of waves is very is very power consuming by doing inductive means. And most of the articles you see there are uh, exciting spin waves with antennas and coplanar co waveguides. This jeopardizes the overall efficiency. It's not a very good type of excitation. Uh, there are some uh, articles that, are, that already talk about the excitation by using uh, current, you know, uh, spin current, spin current or uh, electrical current, which is better. better. Uh, but one challenge we have here is that the devices of magnetics are too big compared to electronics, typical electronics. They, they need to miniaturize more. So there are some advances in using the exchange spin waves with the wavelength is much smaller uh, in the nanometer range. And these ones, I believe they're, they can be more competitive uh, with the current, current technology. They have higher frequency and, and lower uh, wave numbers. So I believe they are more competitive. Uh, the challenge is to, to have technology for, for higher gigahertz range uh, excitations and, and detection. To do that in the, in the 10 gigahertz or 20 gigahertz in, in, a uh, in laboratory is one thing. To do that in industry might be uh, a bit more challenging. Okay, thank you. That's a very full and very... Um... Very fair and honest assessment. It's good to, good, good to hear. I, I think the, the, the physics associated with this is what's really interesting and intriguing. And the opportunities it presents, as you've shown, very, very complex systems can occur and you get hybridization between different, different excitations, etc. So um, I, I don't worry too much myself about the real potential. We hang these things on applications, but we, do, we shouldn't worry too much about the ultimate applications potential. Um, but but, but I, uh, just a, com uh, just a quick comment. Yes. Uh, I do believe the the elastic excitation of uh, spin waves is one way. Uh, these can become uh, industry desired uh, objects because uh, interdigital transducers are used in, in cell phones, in telecommunications. They are very used. So this would be a, a way of uh, getting in industry these type of, of devices. Uh, would be that that's why I'm so passionate about the, this. Uh, thing these <laughs> because I do believe uh, if we want to have something competitive to be in industry, it, it might be the, the the a good way to to achieve that. But yeah. uh, as I said, the, the 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 underlying physics is also very rich and very interesting and <laughs> exciting. Thank you. That's a very good and enthusiastic answer. Um, you're a true <laughs> advocate for magnonics. It's always good to hear. Um, but you see, you, 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 in your experimental work, you, 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 you're picking the iconic archetype material, uh, YIG, I think you pronounced it, YIG. We have a slight continental difference in our pronunciation, but we know the material we're talking about. Uh, uh, how, how do you pronounce that? <laughs> I, I would say I would say YIG. I think you said YIG. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. That's a small, that's a small, small cultural difference. Uh, <laughs> This material is very, very old and very well known now. And one of the things that always concerns me in magnonics, uh, uh, but particularly in your work, is um, you need this material is, is continuing to be chosen because it has very, very low damping. But 
if you're doing magnetoelastic excitation, actually you want to have a material which has got an optimized magnetostriction as well. But is there any other other materials where you can balance this ultra low damping with this? So I guess you want a biggest magnetostriction as possible. Is that that would be my first question? But then how, how do we balance this? And is YIG going to be our only material in the future? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that, that was one challenge for us. Because in principle, uh, when you think about the magnetoelastic material to do those experiments, you think about nickel. Uh, it's the one that the standard one uh, in the, the articles of Sean. But uh, Sergio Resende is a very enthusiastic uh, about YIG. And so the, the article, the Holanda article, which the, there is the magnum funnel interconversion, they use YIG. So we've seen that it's possible to detect uh, with the really well light scattering uh, technique, they could detect that. So we focus on that material because of the history of being used in, in that experiment. Uh, this one, I, I, I don't know if uh, you remember, it's this. So they use this material. So they have an uh, important know-how of using these uh, material for this uh, spin wave experiment. So that's why we went with that. But yes, as, as, as you said, if you want to maximize the, the magneto, uh, magnetoelastic uh, effects, maybe it's not the optimal material. Maybe you should go with nickel. Uh, and there are also some uh, insulating material. Th this is the, insulate, the ma magnet magnetic insulating material that is most used for for even these magnetoelastic uh, experiments. So we're just uh, trying to run away from some problems on having uh, a metallic material there. But mainly we, we chose Yeg because of the history of the, of the uh, Sergio's group of using Yeg in, the, in their expertise in, in doing these experiments. Okay, thank you. Well, before I continue, Ruben, I, I don't know, I, I, I have 101 questions I could ask, so I'm not sure how long you would like me to speak for before you, you know, so. Hang on, you're on mute. So. Yeah, you're free to continue. We, okay, we okay, okay. okay. Then if something is left later, I will talk about it. <laughs> so, so, so Danilo, um, is, is there work going on where people are looking at different materials with low damping and high mag magnetoelastic, uh, high magnetostriction, or is that something you're not familiar with? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, the ones I'm, I'm familiar with are typically nickel or cobalt, cobalt iron boron. And for insulating materials, the YIG. These are the ones I'm more familiar with. But probably there are some people studying uh, magne magnetoelastic materials uh, more efficient, but I'm not very much familiar with okay. uh, this. Okay. So actually talking about your, the, the nickel and the cobalt iron boron, um, I, I would like to talk about materials in general. So I'm going to come on to talk about zinc oxide. But uh, why did you do all of your micromagnetic simulations with nickel and cobalt iron boron when you your experimental work has been focused on, on YIG? Oh, uh, <laughs> there, there was a technical uh, reason for that. Uh, it was because of the frequency, the frequency range of the of the the magnetoelastic uh, crossover. So here is in the uh, as you can see here for EIG was in the four gigahertz frequency range, uh, and for the micromagnetic simulations we uh, for uh, due to the 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 file saving the DT you had to use we would prefer for it to be in a higher frequency range. So in the order of 20 gigahertz. So nickel was one uh, which had this and, and cobalt iron bar also in the 20, 25 gigahertz, the crossover region for these uh, magnetic fields. But just because of that, just as a toy model for the, for okay. the, for these uh, experiments. It, it just looking ahead for thesis writing, it's always worth putting those kind of details early on in, okay. in, in a report because it would be helpful for the reader to understand because it's a sort of serious, it's a serious clash you see here. There's this wonderful experimental work on YIG and then you, you're using thin film metallic systems for the... Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, you mentioned two, two uh, ferromagnetic metals. You mentioned nickel 
And you mentioned cobalt iron boron, but you didn't specify what the composition of the cobalt iron boron is. What was oh, it? Okay. Okay. So uh, we actually we're actually just using. Uh, in, in, in the magnetoelastic, uh, in the micromagnetic simulations, uh, sorry, we're just using these these properties, which is uh, for cobalt iron boron, which is which is uh, it's an approximated model for the uh, oh my god I can't remember right now exactly the composition, but this this were the parameters we employed. I can I can verify which is the okay. proportion. Uh, that, that, that information is also missing from your report. Okay. Um, this is a kind very of, important point. Yeah. Yeah. It, these are these seem like small details, but they're absolutely critical. Somebody else can replicate. In this case, somebody can replicate because you give all of the parameters there. But in practice, you should. So, was this material chosen for any particular reasons of magnetostriction or particular reasons of damping? Or, or, or and cobalt iron boron is normally an amorphous material. Does the crystallographic structuring have any impact? Yeah. So, tell me why. Tell me why you chose cobalt iron boron. Oh, for, for this simulation, oh, uh, it, it was a very technical thing as well, because uh, we're actually uh, testing the magnetoelastic module of Mumax. Uh, it was not ready yet when we started talking to them and they started sending the information about this uh, magnetoelastic module. So they had only tested for this material with these parameters for this cobalt iron boron. And uh so we are just we're not very uh confident about the module yet so we had to do some testing and it was nicer to compare to the to experimental results but it was nicer to use the same material as they they were using for, for for so they could compare with our results and so it was something just to to get familiarized with the module uh, that's why we chose this uh, specific material. But it does have a significant significant magnetostriction. It's a negative one, uh, both B1 and B2. Uh, these, uh, I believe, I believe they've chosen that material. The Mumex group chosen this material because of this frequency region of the cross anti-crossing to being the 20 gigahertz uh, range, and. And the, the difference, the delta frequency here is uh, half uh, half gigahertz, so it's 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 big, so it can be readily seen. Uh, I believe they chose this material, but we cho chose this material so we could compare our results with them in order to make sure they were matching and that okay. they were going the same direction. With with them with their experimental and micromagnetic simulations. They are micromagnetic simulations. Okay. Okay. So they were using my. They 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 looked at this and you were looking at. You were trying to replicate. Okay. I see. I see. But the material itself is not optimized in any sense for this particular application. Would you say? No. Not not necessarily. Not necessarily. They it's they do they do have a, a, a strong uh, magnetoelastic coupling coefficient. But it was not optimized for, it was not chosen for optimization. We did not try many materials and saw that that was the optimal one. We didn't do that. But you need, you need low damping, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Is this a good material, in terms of metallic ferromagnets, is this a good material for low, for, for low damping? Yeah, it is, it is, it is all. Does it have the same value across all compositions of cobalt iron or is it? Is, is it, no. is, does it strongly depend on the composition? Yeah, it is strong depend on the composition, right? So do we, you can have, we can optimize the, the composition of the achieve a lower uh, dumping. Okay. Is, the, is your composition optimized for that in this case? Do you know, or is it just a random? It is, it is, it is. It is uh, this is probably one of the, uh, comp the composition that it was being compared to, these properties were withdrawn from uh, a low damping composition of cobalt iron boron. Okay. Do you know why they chose a, um, why they chose an amorphous structure rather than a crystalline material? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I do believe uh, that for the simulations, well, with not having uh, an isot crystalline magnetocrystalline anisotropies, just simplifies the the equations and the if we want to compare that to theory, just simplifies our our calculations. So it's a way of having a simple uh, toy model for the magnetoelastic 
uh, interaction. I do believe it's that. I under, uh, okay, yeah, that's great. So that brings me on to com a comparison of modeling with experiments, thinking about this. So uh, in your details of your micromagnetics, you say that actually at the boundary conditions, you, you have an increasing damping as you go towards the edges of the structure. Yeah. Will this impact the result that you see in comparison to somebody doing an experimental uh, analysis on the same notional structure? Okay, this this increasing dumping in, in the edges, it's the we call them the, the absorb absorbing boundaries. Yeah, this yeah. absor these absorbing boundaries, they are typically done in simulations because uh, in simulations, as we do not have, uh, there are no dumping outside the the, the material, so the wave is reflected uh, in simulations. In, in reality, there there are some other dumping uh, phenomena like uh, thermal dumpings, which these, these reflections are not realistic. So if we allow these reflections to happen, we only get the, the oh, I forgot the word, but <laughs> you only get the normal modes of the, of the waves. Uh, and in, ex in experiment, we have uh, enough space for this to, to be damping. So these are unrealistic and the, these reflections at the edges need to be uh, contained uh, in the simulation. So this is very typical of simulations with uh, uh, waves. Uh, we need these absorbing boundaries. Okay, so in, in reality, you believe there's, um... There are sufficient natural uh, absorption at the interfaces that, and is there yeah. a, is, is there experimental evidence for that? Yeah, yeah, there. Are, so there, there are, are papers. If I I can find some papers and it will show me this. Yeah, yeah. There there are papers only uh, on how to do these absorbing boundaries, how to do an efficient absorbing boundary. There there is. Uh, uh, optimize it to look at re comparing to reality. So there, are, this is a very uh, uh, hot topic in simulations. So it's a very important topic in simulations and to, how to do these absorbing so they look like reality. Okay, okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to move on actually and talk about zinc oxide. Um, okay. So your zinc oxide was um, Interesting. My first question would, would simply be, what was the composition that you have? What, do, is it stoichiometric, one-to-one? -one, or do you have, is it 0.95 zinc, 1.05 oxide? How do you know what your stoichiometry is? Yeah, we, we, did, we didn't do any tests in the stoichiometry. stoichiometry. Uh, we didn't do that. Uh, we just followed uh, some papers. Uh, the, the, the first thing I think it's important to mention, uh, the work was not, uh, we wanted to do a fast uh, depositing of the zinc oxide material in order to be piezoelectric. So we were not very careful with all the details of the deposition. I believe that was an error we made. We should have uh, come back and, and, and measure the stoichiometry and, and, and have other types of measurements in order to verify the properties of the zinc oxide. Uh, but this proved out to be uh, not a good thing we've done. But uh, we didn't measure this commentary. We're just comparing with the, we're seeing how in literature this was done. And we're just repeating and, and doing some checks with the X-ray diffraction and the cross section in the, the electron microscopy. And, and after doing that, we straight went to, to put the interdigital transducer. So can, can you go back to the previous screen with the X, XRD? So there's a couple of things I want to ask you. I mean, if firstly, if we look at the graph on the right, you, if, if you're increasing the oxygen concentration of gas during the deposition, would you expect to change the the, the oxygen or the oxygen content of your film? Yes, yes, we we were expecting that. So is that what's happened? So you are changing? Is it is it is it going interstitial? Is it I mean, what's happening? Where's that oxygen going? Is it were you, was it were you on you know was it under oxygen? Was it uh, you know was it lacking oxygen and then you 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 brought it up to a stoichiometric value or are you now pumping oxygen in and distorting the lattice? What's do you have any yeah. idea? Can you speculate? Yeah, I I believe uh, that when we did we were actually doing uh, our the target we used was a zinc oxide target, 
uh, in the radio frequency magnet range sputtering. Well, when we did the deposition without oxygen, we didn't have the, the correct orientation. We did form all the, uh, the, the ZNO was depositing in a substrate in another orientation, and the, another crystalline structure than the zero zero to direction, maybe because there was not uh, uh, sufficient oxygen, the oxygen was being lost in the sputtering process. And we may be forming some metallic zinc in some parts. Uh, we're not sure, we, we need to verify. But when we start having oxygen, as expected from literature, we start having these uh, strong orientation in the zero, zero, two uh, direction. And, and the, uh, Okay. <laughs> That's good. So when I look at the XRD plots on the left, I see if I look at the, the, the one at the bottom on the, on the left, on the right hand side of those, uh, it looks like the peak is, is, is shifted for different um, conditions of your deposition conditions. So what do, what's your interpretation of that? Uh, we believe there were some uh, internal strings uh, due to the deposition. That's because there, there was some, some shifting. Uh, that's what that actually made I think that we needed th some thermal treatment in order to relax this strain. So we did this thermal treatment at 400 degrees, uh, which made the, the, the peaks more symmetric, a little bit more symmetric. Uh, and at 600 uh, degrees, uh, we, we actually created some uh, deformations in the, this maybe was not the most effective one. So that's why we decided to go with the, Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I should move on because I'm asking a lot of, quite a lot of questions here. Um, so you, I really like the work you did on the spin pumping, this analysis with the micromagnetics, um, but I have a slightly more general, spin pumping is one of my uh, current hot topics. Um, if, if you cover your material with zinc, if you had zinc oxide on the surface, is it possible to, to, to pump, uh, to spin pump into zinc oxide? And if it is, would it affect the damping or would you be able to see any effect of that spin pumping? Oh, okay, so uh, this is important to, to, to show that there was some, uh, we did the ferromagnetic, I didn't get there, I don't have the results in this computer, but I can send you, uh, we did the ferromagnetic resonance with the IG, the IG uh, samples uh, with and without the zinc oxide. The alpha, the Gilbert dumping changed uh, by the depositing the ZNO, so there is some spin pumping uh, happening uh, due to the to the zinc oxide, and but I, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, that, I don't know if I answered you. But. No, no, that's that's fine. I, it was it was pure speculation on my part. So uh, I, it's interesting because you were, you know, the the it's the the procession will generate a. Um, the procession will, will, will generate the, the potential for a spin current and therefore in principle it should be, it can it can go through uh, into an insulator as, as well as it can go into a metallic system so you would expect to be pumping some spins in, into that whether that gives you enhanced damping i don't know but anyway it's a possibility that you would lead to some enhanced damping i've realized i've talked for quite a while and asked quite a few questions i have more but i will just like to really finish at this point ruben by just asking in your future work, actually, your future work was rather um, briefly described in the report. Can you just tell us what your aims are for your work going forward? What are the key things you want to do next? What are the key things you're trying to achieve as part of your, to bring your, your work to a cohesive conclusion? So, so the, the thing I'm most excited about is to actually get the, to improve the, to actually have an, a surface acoustic wave experiment to, to see the peaks of the acoustic waves there and put a magnetic material in the middle and see the elastic uh, excitation of the magnetization dynamics. This is what I expect. To do that, uh, I believe for the time frame I still have, uh, maybe we would need the lithium niobite commercially bought uh, substrates because we probably don't have much time to improve the ZNO, the, the position, films, the position, uh, to optimize that. But so experimentally, I want to improve the, how we're doing the, the measurements. So using VNA uh, instead of using voltmeters and having a more complex setup, uh, I believe we can do that. And 
Well, we just need to to obtain the 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 correct uh, uh, substrate, uh, and numerically, I really want to publish this art point this uh, interconversion between elastic and magnetic. Uh, uh, but from elastic to magnetic modes and vice versa, I really want to publish that. I believe it's, uh, it's a nice use of the magnetoelastic model of MuMax. Uh, there, there's just one article published, uh, published with this module yet from the their MuMax group. So I believe it's a nice way of, of uh, from a PhD. And I also would like to extend these uh, magnetoelastic modules uh, for confined structures. So there I'm simulating a, an infinite film, but for confined structures, uh, the elastic modes and the magnetic modes can be quite complex. So trying to understand a little bit of that. And uh, I really like magnetic textures. So I was wondering if we could do something with uh, magnetic vortexes or checking the, the elastic modes of magnetoelastic material and have a vortex present or something like this. Okay, thank you. Uh, just just to follow up on one of the things you said. So in the experimental work, will you continue to work on YIG or do you think you will move to some of these metallic thin films so you can then directly compare with with your simulations? It, 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 uh, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, but uh, it depends on the, the time uh, frame we have uh, after we buy these uh, substrates or have, have these substrates in hand. If I have few time, I'll probably go to the metallic ones. But if I have more time, we'll probably do with YIG, so uh, we can send it to uh, Professor Rezender's group and we can measure the brittle one light scattering. But as we're probably not going to have much time, much more time left, uh, our time is very constrained, we're probably going to do with the metallic uh, and not doing the brittle one light scattering experiments uh, for now, maybe just in the future. We're probably going for the metallic ones for nickel or cobalt, cobalt iron boron. Okay, but you think the experimental work is an essential component because you seem to have made more progress with the micromagnetics for obvious reasons. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I think I'll progress more in the micromagnetic. This is the main results I'll have will be in the micromagnetic, but I I do believe I should try at least give some try in the experimental part. Uh, maybe not in, in my PhD. I'll have enough time for that, or maybe after that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you, Dale. Oh, now it's my turn. Uh, well, I would like to say that I really I enjoyed reading. I think it's, uh, it's well written. Uh, the presentation of uh, Danilo is good. And, uh, but I have a, really a few questions. Some of them, uh, they are already addressed in, this, uh, in his comments. Um, but uh, the first of first thing that you know, have you ever tried to produce the surface acoustic waves? Have you ever just tried to do the experiment without the magnetic material? Don't you think that this is the, the first thing you should have done? Because yeah. th let me let me say why why I'm saying that that because uh, I was a. Uh, um, a referee for several projects. Some of them I'm still following because I have to visit. It was a cooperation between a company and a, a laboratory, and they 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 use it to do these uh, use surface acoustic waves using these very sophisticated uh, contacts uh, deposit over uh, uh, graphene oxide. Graphene oxides uh, absorbs a lot of water, so the, the 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 frequencies of the waves would change, so they could measure. The idea was they could measure the the amount of water in a given environment by looking at the changes. So, what I learned from that is that it's an art to design the 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 contacts for the the correct substrate you're using so it, it seems to me that you have uh, just made well let me do some interdigitized contest it should work but it didn't right so i would like you to comment that how are you going to address that to me this is the more complicated thing that you have to address 
I, I agree with you. Uh, we are we are kind of naive when we start doing that uh, because doing this interdigital transducers from scratch is a PhD thesis itself. It, it is very hard to do those. Uh, we need a complex setup. We need very good contact electrical context, and the, this to, to obtain a very good one, it takes time. Yeah, but you solve it, those technical problems. The problem is not the the execution, the production of the content, but the it seems to me it is the design, the proper design. You know, right? This is an art. This is what I think you should maybe for the rest of the of your PhD work to, to you know, are, uh, some priority in revising that. What is going on? What what are the tricks? Mm -hmm. So this is my first comment. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for the comment. I believe that that's important. That's the most important thing. Uh, we we underestimated the the complexity of these uh, devices. Okay. Um, another point, which is to me is crucial, is that well, what, what is the dumping of your? Um, Eeg film because the 500 angstrom, uh, 500 nanometer, right? Half a micron. It's mm -hmm. a very thick, very thick uh, film compared with the films I grow in the lab, in the same lab as you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, well, you, have you measured this this, this dumping? With some... uh, we we have measured. Uh, we're actually quite surprised because we want a, th a thick uh, EEG uh, film. And we were only doing five, uh, 50 nanometers, 20 nanometers. So we just had like a trial. Let's try to do a 500 nanometers one and see uh, what happens. Uh, uh, we had a dump in the order of uh, uh, five to the minus three, if I'm not wrong. But I, I will verify that and, and send it to you the, the. Yeah, this is not that good, right? Because five to yeah. three is already almost the dumping of or something right? yeah it, it was not very good uh now uh, the point is how long did did this uh the position take oh it took <laughs> i i don't remember exactly i can also verify that but it didn't take that long i, I don't remember it taking many hours okay because depending on the power you can also modify your target so this is the yeah. point you have to consider mm -hmm. and check the target after your deposition process to see if you still have the same. Okay. Okay. This is a, an important thing. The other thing is uh, you are planning to use VNA. Okay. I, I do have VNAs and there are other groups that have VNAs in, in, at CBPF. Mm -hmm. But I, it seems to me that you are very happy, too happy maybe with the with the frequency where you have this gap, you have this effect on the dispersion relation. Can you show that the calculation for cobalt iron born? It's very oh, okay. important to give to, to, to here. Yeah, you said, oh, I have here. This is just 20, 20 gigahertz. Uh, this is for the simulation. Uh, this yeah. is a good range for, for the size yeah, but, of the but for for the experimentals. Uh, part of this work. What do you yeah. think about? Do you think it's a good frequency? It's a, it's a high frequency for the experimental part. It, it's a good frequency for the simulations. And that's why we're, at the experimental part, we were employing the IG because this crossover region is in around four gigahertz for... Yeah, because IG. there is a problem, you know, that although I, I do have a VNA with 26 gigahertz maximum frequency, the cables don't go to that high frequency. So we cannot effectively use these high frequencies. Okay. We're limited around 18, for now, 18 to 20 gigahertz. Okay, this is a problem. We have, we do have some cable, special cables that go up to 24 gigahertz that are the cables that were bought with the, the other VNA. So you have to pay attention to that. Right. It right. is very happy for the simulations. It's not very good for the experiment. And I mm -hmm. believe that you have a you have you already have a, made a, a 
a good experimental effort here, so you should keep doing the experiments. Simulations you can do easily, but uh, the experiment is the real thing that I, I, I think you should uh, uh, look for. Right. Uh, okay. I have a few comments in your text. I will give you my 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 uh, my PDF version with some notes. Nothing really bad. Uh, just a few comments, and um, and I I I believe that uh, you should uh, have in mind what next in a clear way that much clearer way that you presented and you 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 have in the text okay because the next steps are very important and you don't have that much time you i don't know if thou knows what is the um what are the 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 deadlines in brazil but you have danilo has 48 months to finish the phd um I know that in Europe in general it's three years, then the guy is out, but uh, uh, here is four years, so he's already 27 months, right, if I understood. And, uh, no, I actually, actually I'm doing this a little bit late because of the COVID pandemic, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, so the idea, yeah, the idea for me is to qualify in the beginning of next year, so I don't have much more time left. Oh, see, no, but uh, how many time do you have? It, uh, so, uh, the uh, end uh, of the fellowship, this is the question. My, my fellowship <laughs> ends in, in March, so I oh, only have... March? Yeah, very oh, few yeah. time. I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> this is fellowship, yeah. but uh, in fact, if he needs more time, he can get more time, but without fellowship, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the problem is that the fellowship. Although this is a strategic project, so maybe we could find if if we have ways to ways to to give some support, we'll do it. But uh, it's not. Uh, we never sure. We never know when this kind of thing. Yeah, but uh, I think you, Danilo, forgot to mention that he has a job already. So. Oh really? <laughs> oh yeah. In this, in this year, I started working in industry, uh, in CGG, in geo geophysics. So, so my time in the laboratory is very, I, I, I don't believe I have much time to do experimental things. So that's why I said I need to focus on the micromagnetic uh, simulations. Maybe this is a recommendation we can give you then <laughs> in this case. Is it better focus on the, on the, the micromagnetic simulations, but you have to, uh, as they already mentioned, it, you know, it's cobalt iron born, maybe a lot of uh, alloys, a lot of compositions. So you have to give it, oh, these parameters are for what, you know? And, um, you know, cobalt iron born sometimes, depending on the, the application, you have that. Um, you deposit the amorphous fumes, then you do an annealing and you crystallize it. So mm -hmm. you have to know what we're doing here, what time. Is, right. this is, so the bottom migrates to some some place in the in a given structure at, at the edge, probably, and then you have a cobalt iron only. It's a crystalline material. So you have to bear to you need to have this kind of thing very clear for your for your uh, next steps. Right. Oh. Uh, I, I can I can I can see this proportional like uh, very quickly. It's it's written. I just need to verify, but I can I can I'll add that to the text and I can make sure you have these. Also, I I I have seen that your text is very is kind of long, right? You have already basically the PhD dissertation is structured here. If I understand, I have seventy two mm -hmm. pages. I got, so, I got a, little bit, a little bit excited with the writing part because I want to no, get it okay. all there. <laughs> I'm not complaining. I'm just okay. <laughs> it seems that you have uh, already made part of the, the dissertation. So that is good. Okay. I think I, I'm done with this. Uh, they already addressed uh, many points. The major points I wanted to, 
comments are these ones I just made and I don't know what the step what are the steps now Dell do you would like to make any more comments or You're yeah I can uh, I so I I completely agree with the the, the the key points that you were making I had made a make significant notes about the early zinc oxide work and you you obviously went straight to a structure Having heard the discussion about the time scale, uh, is it realistic to actually even think about any more laboratory work? Or should you, the, the progress that I see in this project so far has realistically been on the micromagnetics. And I think that's where you have the opportunity to make novel and original contributions, which is what you're expecting for a PhD, of course. You have paper published already, so you you, you know you have you you have some uh, presence in this field. Uh, you, you've demonstrated that you're doing novel work that's of publishable quality. Um, I think a weakness of the work that I see from the micromagnetics is you're doing it as a modeler without great grounding in what's in potential for uh, experimentalists to pick this up and do things with it. Uh, it's really important. Uh, Ruben was making this point as well, you know, you, you've got to apply an experimentalist eye view of material systems and the problems with materials, etc. When the simulations are good, but the simulations are only as good as, as, the, as the reality that you're trying, to ref, you're, 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 you're trying to address. And the simulations are always going to be some kind of approximation because we don't put every bit of physics into them. But it's, it's what, you, what you need to endeavor to do is to produce outputs that will be, that, that can be converted by a experimentalists into, into something that's usable uh, for them. You know, that would be the value of your work, demonstrating these things. And this, if you make like, if you make these structures and you do these kind of measurements, you, I am predicting that you see this. So people can actually replicate what you're doing would be really powerful. That would be a very, very powerful contribution, I would say. Great, great, great. Regarding the regarding the work, I, I, I we don't have quite the same process in the UK of writing such a detailed report. Usually, it's shorter than this, and the interview is much much shorter. Um, what I felt was missing, though, for me when I'm reading it, is details in some places. I mean, for example, take the zinc oxide. You just said I'm choosing zinc oxide. You gave a better definition of why you chose zinc oxide. It still wasn't very strong today, but you gave a better definition of why you chose zinc oxide. You're now saying you're going to go to some uh, lithium niobate or something. Uh, you, there's no mention of why you didn't do that in the first place, etc. So I think more context about some of your decisions would be quite would be quite helpful. I think. Um, I, it, it, I also was looking for damping in which you didn't really mention values in the report. You mentioned them in your talk today, so you ticked that box for me. But Ruben mentioned about this damp. Yeah, this, this damp, I mean, in any, any kind of long, long range um, spin wave propagation, damping is the ultimate parameter of, of interest because that, you know, that governs how far you, that governs the attenuation. So I think more focus on some of the key physical parameters as well would be something I would like to see. In your in, in what we present, what, what we see, I think there's eight pages of background magnetism, um, you know, which is kind of textbook stuff. And that's OK, because it demonstrates that you've understood it, you've been through it and understood it. But then there's not really enough about not enough background about the origin of damping or details like that, I would say. So it's lacking details for me, but that's appropriate for this report. But clearly, when you go to your thesis, you need to think about expanding all of those things out. Um, the, the most experimental information you gave, I think, was, was about the, uh, the BLS. And there was a figure that was nice, you know, but the other things, I mean, I think there were four lines about XRD. You didn't mention about the angular range. You didn't mention about the, the, the resolution of your system or whatever. You didn't tell us whether you could find any other, uh, the, whether there were any other lines. Everything was, was it perfectly, um, perfectly textured or were there other lines indicating that other other components of the crystallographic structure were there as well. So that it was lacking detail in places, I would say, which is fine for this stage, as I've said, but going forward, that's definitely something you need to consider. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so just a sec. Okay.
just a second, someone is... Okay. Um, well, though, um, no, I think now we can move to the next step. There is a form we should uh, fill, you and, um, and me. And we can write down some of these recommendations, the more important. I think yes. he, the, the work is nice, uh, but you ha really have to pay attention. Even if you go through the through the micromagnetics emphasis, you you have to pay attention in many in many issues, because someone is going to make maybe even here at CBPF. So some of us will make these try to make these experiments. I I believe that John Paul uh, have these in mind, and uh, you know, so. Uh, it's a very important to put all, all those details and discuss things the way they are put. So I think now we can go to the next step, right? I will ask people. I don't know, Betty, are you around? Yeah, she's there. Betty? Yeah, we, we can uh, move out. I mean, we can leave the room, let you and uh, and Del inside the room and Betty. Okay. And then you, you can uh, do the, the, the previous work. Um, and yeah. then we announce it later. Okay, we'll come back. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And then no, we 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 don't need to to come back. I mean, uh, I think uh, somebody left. Ah, the the the, the Danilo unshared. Yeah, uh, we we don't need really to come back uh, to any announce. I mean, it's, it's okay. We uh, just send uh, the we, report. Yeah, you just send the report and, to and the Betty will send to Danilo. Yeah, we we'll send to Danilo. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let's do this now. Uh, because the, the, the report is not that he's, if he's approved or an approval, it, it's more like, uh, yeah, the, 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 the work is okay. He will be finished or not. The, the suggestions you made, that's it more or less. You know? Oh, there is a okay. approved or, or not approved here somewhere. Yeah, no, but, but it's, it's not the yeah. idea is to make yeah. the recommendations, right? Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, in, in, in some cases, if the, 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 the work has nothing, then of course, the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, uh, it's not the case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just want to, to point out that, um, well, there, there was a, a Danilo was very, how do you say, as, as, as Bell mentioned sometimes, very enthusiastic, even though when the epidemics hit us and uh, we had to switch off the whole uh, air conditioning system in the lab nano, so we didn't have access to, uh, it was very difficult to, to access the Institute for, for sputtering and so on, uh, for x-rays and then for lithography was simply out of business during complete year almost. Right? Uh, then uh, even the, he tried some uh, laser right things, it worked us sometimes, but anyway, he was, although all of these problems, he was very enthusiastic and very dedicated, I would say. And so he finished that paper uh, with the help with Luis Sampaio and Mercedes. And so this was a very good achievement, I think. So I'm very proud of him, I would say. And um, that's it. I don't know if Mercedes want to make any addressments or Luis, but... Uh, uh, yes, I want to congratulate, uh, congrats, uh, Danilo, uh, because uh, he's a very complete scientist. Uh, he managed uh, everything in the lab, uh, experimental details. Uh, he have a complete domain on what he's doing, and also the the part of uh, the work in simulations. Uh, he had the ability of adapt himself in the in the pandemic uh, period, and it was uh, very successful in the, after that. Uh, not every student have uh, has this uh, ability, uh, and he never gave up in the in the in this context. Uh, so I uh, I'm very proud of him uh, too. Okay, uh, Ruben, uh, Betty is having some uh, connection issues, so I will remain. I, I will I will stop my video, mute myself, and 
turn down the volume so I don't hear you, minimize the, the, the window, but I will keep here just in case uh, Betty loses the connection again, uh, if you need some instructions and so on, okay? Okay, okay. So thank you very much, Danilo. Thank you very much, Wal, for your time, for the all the talks. Uh, I'm very happy, excited, and thank you. Thank, thank you, Danilo, and uh, good luck with the next phase of your PhD work and and your job also. Sound, your new job sounds exciting as well. But um, yeah, don't let your PhD run too far into your new position. <laughs> thank you. It, it becomes really, really, really challenging to complete in those circumstances. Okay. Yeah. I'll do everything I can to, to finish on time and <laughs> and keep things working. Okay. And so, now I ask you all. Uh, uh, only oh, and myself and uh, Jean will stay. Okay. So I'll leave do, we, do I have to go out or? Yeah, yeah please. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Have... Thank you. Bye. bye. Have a great day. Bye. Right. Um, Beth, você abre o microfone? Você está aí? Ok. Just as. Yeah, she that. was she was saying that the, the she had a very unstable connection. So I, I will mute okay. myself. Okay, Derek, I will I will uh, share the the document so yeah. I can okay. read it for you, and then we can decide the things. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, this is it. Um, oh, so he says that uh, this is the coordination for scientific education. That John Paulo is the the head. Yeah. This is the exam of uh, PhD qualification. Information for the for the committee. The qualification exam. Uh, will consist on the presentation of a talk, approximately 30 to 40 minutes, with the PhD project, and it should include a revision of the chosen team, uh, results obtained up to the moment, and uh, perspectives for the conclusion of the work within the the regular regular deadline. Yeah. And then uh, this is followed by our 